Jesus said, New commandment I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Tonight, we have come together on this Thursday evening to remember Jesus' deep love for us. And so if you're gathered here in this room, uh, we certainly welcome you. For those who join us online, we welcome you as well. This evening, as we spend this time together, we are going to be taken in our mind's eye to that upper room where Jesus spent his last evening with his disciples. We'll hear the story once again of uh, his sacrificial love for us. We will spend time there listening uh, to his words to his disciples. We will watch and hear and experience his love in firsthand fashion. And so I'm really glad that you have chosen to make your way out here this evening in the midst of this uh, holy week, really, as we recall Jesus' journey to the cross, this stop in your week. You have set aside time to stop and to pause and to remember. And so as we have done that together, I'm glad that you have chosen to do just that. You know, as the scripture tells us in Luke's gospel, chapter 22, verses 7 to 16, then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare it? They asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asked, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. chapter 13 verse 1 through 17 it was just before the Passover festival Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father having loved his own who were in the world he loved them to the end the evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas the son of Simon Iscariot to betray Jesus Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power 
and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, Peter said, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Father, we have come together this evening. In the quiet of this room, we have come from some very busy days, others from perhaps or even a relaxing day. But we have come from our homes, we have come from our businesses, we have come from our jobs or those places where we had obligations and we have gathered, we have settled, we have taken our places in this room. So help us to be here and to truly hear from you, to hear from your word, just to breathe in this moment and to be so aware and sensitive to your presence, to be mindful that you sat physically, Jesus, you sat physically in a room with 12 men whom you called your disciples those that you had spent the past three years with, those that you had poured your life into, and yet you had some final lessons to teach them. You had called them to leave all of life to follow you, and they had done so. And you're still calling, and you're still teaching. And so tonight, may we hear your call, your voice, May we be taught and may we love more deeply, having seen your deep love for us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Yeah. 
this evening in Luke 22, verse 17 to 20. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. It's hard to imagine just what Jesus did. He laid aside his crown for our soul. And that reminds us and that makes us humble to consider that someone would do such a great act of service and love for us. Jesus was constantly teaching his disciples what love looked like. He was constantly teaching his disciples what it meant to be a servant. The preparations had been made. They entered the upper room, the 12 of them along with Jesus. They came in, they sat down, they settled in and waited to be served. The meal was being served. And Jesus got up from the table, excused himself. There was something that had been missed. There was no servant who had met them at the door. And certainly they had all prepared for this time and they had walked the dusty roads to get to this special location where they would spend this evening with Jesus. And they came in and they sat down and settled in and waited to be served. Jesus himself got up from the table and taking water and pouring it into a basin. The sound of it caused them to stop the silence and the room could be felt. As Jesus took the towel and began to dip it in the water and go from disciple to disciple, washing their feet and drying them with the towel, that was wrapped around his waist, they realized what it meant to be loved, what it meant to be served. Jesus said, no servant is greater than his master. 
As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Interesting to note, Jesus washed all of the disciples' feet that night, including Judas, including the very one who would betray him just a short time later that evening. On your chair, as you came in tonight, you found a simple towel, a simple washcloth. It's a symbol of that which we use to clean things, maybe clean ourselves or maybe clean up around the house, maybe to do a chore, maybe to do that thing which, well, maybe we really would rather someone else do. Tonight, as we reflect on Jesus saying this, I have set for you an example that you should do for one another as I have done for you. That we would consider as you take your towel there where you sit for just a moment and imagine yourself in that room seeing Jesus pick up the towel and he saying to you, I have set for you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Who might you serve at home, in community, in your workplace? How might you, how might I show love as Jesus has shown love for us so we should do for others? He calls us to love in sacrificial and servanthood love. Not coming in and settling in and sitting down and waiting to be served, but coming in and asking how can I serve? That's a very different mindset. And Jesus said, this is how love is shown. Love is shown as you serve one another, as you care for one another, as you take on the lowliest of tasks, you show love one for another. And no one is above the master who set for us an example. Consider how deeply you are loved Consider how great Jesus' service was to us, for indeed he is our ultimate example of a sacrificial servant, and he invites us to follow his example. Let's continue to hear the story as it unfolds in the words of John's Gospel, chapter 19, verse 1 through 24. Then Pilate took Jesus, had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail the King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews that were gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said, don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, 
Pilate tried to set Jesus free. But the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out, sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the stone pavement. It was on the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Jesus, Son of God, Son of Man, facing the final hours of his life on earth. He gathered his closest friends, his disciples, together in the upper room of a private dwelling. They shared the Passover meal, and he gave them final instructions. There was so much to tell them. There was so much to remember. Night had fallen. The celebration was ending. Jesus knew that his enemies were finally catching up with him and were plotting his death. But he knew that this was all part of the plan. He wanted to be alone and talk to his father. So he went out to the garden called Gethsemane. There, in grief and in fear, he knelt and wept and prayed. Father, my soul is in agony. I do not want to go through the pain I know is waiting for me. My flesh wants no part of it. But Father, he said, I know you have sent me here for a purpose, that I become you among men. I was sent in hopes that all men would see me and then see you. Yet they are so blind, Father, so blinded by their own short-sighted expectations and selfish desires that they still cannot see you. Finally, he prayed, Father, I love them so much, so much that I will fulfill your purpose. I will surrender my flesh to you on their behalf. I will die for them. He was despised and rejected, man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He took up our infirmities. He carried our sorrows. He was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. But his punishment would be our peace, and his wounds would make us whole. Through life's fear. 
John's Gospel, chapter 19, verses 25 and following, hear these words. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happen. So that the scripture would be fulfilled, not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was the disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus. And he brought a mixture, the man, Nicodemus, the man who had earlier visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. And taking the body of Jesus, the two of them wrapped it with spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. And at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. This evening, as we come to the table, we remember Jesus, our suffering servant, who willingly not only picked up the towel to serve, but willingly laid down his life for you and for me. 
The prophet Isaiah spoke of the suffering servant hundreds of years before Jesus fulfilled its words completely. In the words of Isaiah chapter 53, who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in the dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with the deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised, and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. We thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. As we come to the table this evening, we do so mindful of just what Jesus did for us and the healing that we have because of him from our sinfulness. In just a moment, our deacons will come and serve you tonight where you are. As we come together as one body to share in this time of communion, let me share this invitation with you as you prepare your heart. Will you come to this sacred table not because you must, but because you may? Will you come not to testify to your righteousness, but that you sincerely love the Lord Jesus Christ and desire to be his true disciple. Will you come not because your goodness gives you a right to come, but because in your frailty and sin you stand in need of heaven's mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord a little and want to love him more. Come because he loved you and gave himself for you. Lift up your hearts above your cares and your fears let this bread and cup be a sign of God's grace to you and a pledge of your love to the Lord Jesus. Receive the love of God and consecrate your life afresh to Christian obedience and service this evening that you may discover and do the will of God in humble faith as he leads you. Will you please now take a moment and prepare your heart as we prepare to serve. We invite all baptized believers to participate with us in this time of remembering our Lord. And I'll invite our deacons now to come and prepare to serve you. Will you prepare your heart?
evening as Jesus spent his final time with his disciples, that final Passover meal that he had so eagerly desired to serve. The scripture tells us that he took bread and that he broke it, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. The disciples understood sacrifice. They understood the sacrificial system. And though Jesus had told them what was about to happen, they didn't fully understand it. They didn't understand that it was personal. They didn't understand that it was for the world. Tonight you have in your hands, and if you would turn the cup and the bread that you have so that the cup is on t uh, the bread is on top, please. And if you would remove the seal and taking the bread. We would hear once again Jesus' words as he said to his disciples that night, this is my body which is broken for you. Let's take and eat and remember him. Jesus, we remember your words, knowing that your body was given for us, that indeed you were broken, that you were wounded, that we might be made whole. And we give you thanks. On that same night, Jesus took the cup, and there in the light of the upper room, he said to his disciples, who understood very well that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Jesus took the cup and he said to them, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins of many. Will you now take opening the other side of your cup, revealing the juice. And as you do so, Will you hear again Jesus' words? This is my blood poured out for you. Let us take and drink and remember him. And Jesus, the sweetness of the vine, reminds us of the relationship that is made possible because of the sacrifice and the shedding of your very own blood. Our sins are forgiven by your sacrifice, and we give you thanks in your name. Amen. We hear the story. Jesus sacrificed his suffering, his death. And honestly, we wonder where was God? How could he allow such things to happen to his own son? Today, we still wonder when we see unexplainable suffering and death, where is God? How could he allow? such things to happen, if we were to be honest. And we stand on this side, we understand, we see, we know so much more today than they knew on that evening, and certainly in the days that shortly followed, that God had a plan. His plans always go beyond what is happening in the moment. His thoughts are not our thoughts, his ways are not our ways. They are much higher, and there's always a bigger story going on. It's important to keep that in mind. It is said that on Jesus' last evening with the disciples, after they had finished eating, they sang a hymn and went out into the night. We know they made their way down across the Kidron Valley, stopping in the vineyards that were there, where Jesus taught them so much about abiding in him 
as you continue through your week and as we leave this evening, I'll ask you to leave this room with quiet hearts and reverent spirits, remembering our Lord and gratitude to him. Let us also hold on to that ray of hope that is ours, that soon we too will celebrate his victory in the very near future. As we stand and as we sing our final hymn, let us do so and then depart in quiet reflection. Savior, go and serve. You're dismissed.